All right, this is Neil Rockine. Welcome to another edition of Killer Cross-Examination. And um, I'm excited to have John Marco here. John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Neil. It's been a long time coming, man. I'm proud to be here hanging out with you. I know. Well, we're not actually hanging out in the same room, but I feel like a connection. So, all right, so John, it's tell close us a little. Enough. And, and for, for those who know, John and I have uh, been uh, uh, flirting with the this the idea of, of having John on the podcast it just hasn't happened until now and um, uh, through no fault of his own he's been a guest that I've wanted to have on for a while and uh, he's just got an incredibly busy packed trout calendar he's in high demand so John thanks for being here John tell me like um, just kind of tell me how you got started um, and tell me about your law practice yeah, so I, I went to law school out in D.C., and then I took my first job for as a law clerk for the Michigan Supreme Court. And when I hired in, I uh, got to work for a great lady justice by the name of Marilyn Kelly. And when I, when I started, we were writing dissents all the time because she was one of the liberal justices and... Uh, it was her and one other liberal justice. And then every other justice on the court was very conservative. And so I spent most of my first year writing dissents and then uh, the court flipped kind of unexpectedly and uh, which was cool. It was a cool experience. And then after I left, after two years, I went to work for Jeffrey Figer, who's a well-known legendary trial attorney here in Michigan and that's where I started to actually learn trial skills because I was writing, you know, as a law clerk, you're stuck in a office reading and writing all day long, nonstop. And so it was a nice change to be able to go hit the road, hit the courtroom with Jeff and learn how to be a real trial lawyer, take depositions, go to motions. I did all kinds of stuff all over the state. And that's where I really learned how to pre how to start practicing. Uh, as a trial lawyer. And then um, I went to a small firm briefly, and then I started my own law firm after that and um, specialize in personal injury. And we do a lot of civil rights and employment cases, which are really tough cases. They take a long time. There's a lot of appeals, things of that nature. So what was it like to practice side by side in trials with Jeffrey? It was awesome. The guy's a genius, regardless of you either love Jeff or hate him. I usually find is, is, is the general consensus, but regardless, he is a great trial attorney. And as a young lawyer, it was the best possible experience I could have had. And I don't think I appreciated it back then as much as now I look back. Cause it was hard. It was a lot of work. We were working long hours. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, you're making mistakes, you're getting yelled at. The pressure, the pressure was high, but in that short amount of time, you learn and suck in so much so quickly. You don't really appreciate it at the time, at least I didn't. We, we, we did uh, many multi-million dollar trials together uh, with some of the best lawyers from across the country. <clears throat> I got to see cross, his cross-examination, Baudir, opening, closing, see what to do, what not to do. Uh, so it was a great experience. And I was getting to work on cases I shouldn't have even touched. I mean, my first civil rights case that really got me interested into it was a Detroit SWAT officer shot a two and a half year old little girl in the head. Mm -hmm. And it was all over the news. It was all over the country. It was one of the biggest cases ever. And I was getting to work on it. And so I, I was really lucky to have that opportunity. So Jeffrey's style, Jeffrey is, is commonly referred to as bombastic, but that, that really isn't fair when you watch him in a courtroom because he has so many different speeds and different tones. And, and he really just is sort of a, I mean, he can come at you and he's just got so much charisma. He's got incredible presence. Um, tell me about, um, tell me about your style. Is it similar to his? Is it different than his? What did we able to take away from Jeffrey? What were you able to um, leave on the cutting room floor, so to speak? 
Yeah, you know, I think you learn a lot and you a lot of people take and model, I think, our first mentors. And so there's no question Jeff was my first mentor. And so I did take a lot away from that. I, I, I People have said, you know, you're like Figer Jr. Uh, I've been... <laughs> I, I've been called. I don't know if it's the hair or the style or what, but well, I um, mean, you know, it, it could be the shoes. No, <laughs> you know, it's, it could be anything. Yeah. Jeff taught me the importance of being aggressive. And so, um, and that's aggressive in, through all stages of the litigation. So I definitely would describe myself as aggressive. I think my opponents would describe me as, as aggressive, as exhausting. Um, you know, you have to get back up. You can get knocked down, you can get, you have to get back up, and you have to keep going, um, kind of like a rabid dog, you know, so to speak. So I think I've definitely taken that away as uh, I, I think it's effective to continuously be aggressive. I, that's my style. Um, I, I, I would say that I took a lot from Jeff in that regard. I, I feel like Jeff's cross is his best attribute, I think. I mean, he is – Talk about a killer cross. He has one. I think that uh, my cross examination is one of my better skills. Um, and, uh, but you know, you have to be yourself. So when I was younger and I first tried cases, I tried to model, okay, this is how, what Jeff did and he's successful. And I would try to be Jeff. And I'm not Jeff, you know, I'm my own person. And so the, the best piece of advice that somebody gave me was just be yourself. You can learn things. You can take things away from others, but you have to be yourself. And that, that, that that's phrase, what I try to do. I try to- so true, John. That phrase gets thrown around, though, by, by lawyers. You know, just be yourself, be yourself, be yourself. And, what it, and a lot of people don't know themselves enough to be themselves, right? They don't. That's why they go to a, a trial school or they see a cross examination and they try to mimic, not emulate, not model themselves after, but they try to mimic these other lawyers. Um, and I'm telling you, I have a very similar experience, probably much worse. Can you hear me all right? So, yeah, I had a terrible experience when I was actually trying a case as a, as a young prosecutor, I tried the case and I tried to copy myself after Jeffrey. Um, I was just all over the place, man, swinging from the chandeliers. I thought I was just, you know, and the jury hated me. They hated me. And I went back, I'm like, what did I do wrong? And they're like, well, you're just not that guy. You have your own moments where you're funny and humorous and aggressive, but you're not that guy, right? That was right. A, such a valuable lesson to learn because I did not understand that at the time. So, so tell me, yeah, about, I think- yeah. Tell me your cross-examination style. I know that you're aggressive. First of all, you've got, you do have a good presence. You've got presence and you've got character and you've got shtick. There's, And anybody that wants to see, John, you have not been bashful about posting trials, videos, um, other information out there, some incredible advertisements that you've had out there. Tell me your your because you've got the brio. So tell me, you know, how you apply it in court. So I think my style changes based on the witness, as as we all have to do. You know, a good cross examiner knows. You can't cross-examine the little old lady the same way that you can cross-examine, you know, the evil corporation, you know, lying boss or something like that. And so um, that that was a hard lesson to learn when you can be aggressive and, and kind of do the killer cross as, com- as compared to when you have to do the soft cross. So, you know, if we have a bad guy... Uh, I don't mind going at them and trying to leave some blood on the floor, but not too much because sometimes you can make the jury feel bad for the defendant, no matter how bad they are and say, you know, you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to be that mean, but John, I've um, watched you, know, you cross my, my style, I've watched you cross examine two. I think one was, a, um, I think it was a defense expert in case. 
that I that you were kind enough to send me a clip and then I watched it multiple times and actually I um, showed somebody in my inner circle I was like you got to see this this guy just rendered this I think it was a trial death and just absolutely wrecked this guy and another was an insurance adjuster I think it was an insurance adjuster in a case that you just I mean that if those two people show their face in the courtroom and they have a lot of um, I'll just say a chutzpah <laughs> if they ever show themselves yeah. in a, you may have ruined those folks for courtroom work after that so tell yeah. me about because you seem prepared. You cornered Yeah, them, I do. And you read their CVs. I mean, you were just on top of them. And you were listening carefully to the words they were using. So, you know, there's a lot of preparation. So that defense doctor that you're talking about, you know, some people might go in there and kind of, you know, hit a script, hem and haw. What, what, I, what I like to do, especially when you have experts like that, is there's a lot of great lawyers, better lawyers than me, who've already taken their depositions. So... My first thing that I always do is try to gather as much information about them as possible. And so that's other deposition transcripts. That's things online. You can do research now with, with the internet and the tools that you have to investigate somebody. It is so amazing and so much easier than it was when I first started. So I, I try to get as much information as possible. And then I uh, have to do my homework. So with that defense doctor, I came armed with, I've never met the guy didn't take his depth, didn't take a trial depth, which we do in civil a lot. So we know what they're going to say. So I didn't, I had his report, but I didn't have a deposition, which is fine. Sometimes that can work out better in my opinion, because I believe it, they, they can't be as prepared because they'll read their depth, say, this is where he's going to go. So they don't know where I'm going to go. You're they don't know that I know what I know. Mm -hmm. You're hitting them fresh and they don't know where you're going to run to. So when I show up like for that depth, I'll bring the medical literature. I'll put it. I have piles in front of me. So I walk in with this huge case. I'll lay down all my stuff. So this guy's looking at this and he's thinking, OK, man, this isn't just going to be a normal run of the mill depth. This guy's you know, this, this guy's came prepared and I then have all the transcripts. And I have the medical literature. And so then I can say it keeps him honest because he knows he can't get away with some of the things that he might have more latitude with. And when he does get off the path, I can bring him right back. I can say, you know, doctor, you know, you said this in your deposition in 19, uh, you know, 98, you know, Smith versus State Farm, whatever it is. And I try to set it up like that. So with these defense doctors, I always show the jury who they are right off the bat. These are bought and paid for doctors. This is not your doctor that you're going to treat with for your family or that you're sending your mom to. These are doctors who are billing lots of money from the insurance company. They're making lots of money. They're here for one reason, and that's to make money. Um, and and so I, I go through that. I also go through, you know, with these insurance clearing houses, these doctors get uh, what's heck, it's not what's like a, they, what's an insurance clearing. So I and I do this right in the right in the cross examination, you know, so if, if you know, you know, doctor, uh, it's not like the defense attorney, you know, knows you because you rendered good care or anything like that. He, you were hired through this medical examination company where you get hundreds, thousands of patients a year and you make a lot of money doing that. Right. And all the attorney or insurance company adjuster has to do is they're sitting in their office. They just pick up the phone and dial, you know, 1-800, I need a doctor there. And they say, I have this case with John Marco. And I literally do this and with the doctor. 98% of them and hang up and say, I'm not messing with that guy. But <laughs> yeah, that yeah. 1-800 State Farm or something, they get connected. They say, I have a case with John Marco. He has a, a good doctor in, I don't know, neurology. I need a neurologist who's going to be able to say that we didn't do anything wrong. And then this company connects them with you, right, doctor? And then you get paid through this company. And so, I, you know, it's important. Sometimes we do this so much, we forget that the jury doesn't know as much as we do about who these people are. Like, you know, for us, it's second nature, but we live this and breathe this. So 
it's important to reframe that. And then, um, such a great point. I want to pause doctors. there for a second. Such a great point, John. I'm so glad you said that because it shows such awareness on your part, and it's something that we lawyers miss. If you've been doing this for a long time, you get into defense delirium. That's what we call it. But you know, you fall in love with the lie, right? So you are the line at the putter. You're like, you're on the green. And you're staring at the at the line, the line, the line, and you just you got it all lined up, but you don't hit it hard enough. And because we're so used to, um, oh, they're going to know this guy. Is. They're going to know this guy. Is. Oh, they're, they're going to know that. They're going to know this expert. In the meantime, you have to every case. You're you're taking it fresh. You got to even if you've dealt with this expert before. The jury has absolutely no idea. They think this guy's coming in with a white lab coat, you know what I mean? Right. A lollipop and a sucker, you know, giving it to a, a person at a, you know, at a doctor's office. So you can't skip over those those beginning steps. That's so true. Let me ask That's you this: it. Do any of the do any of the doc, do any of the the insurance adjusters, do they ever use any of the lawyers that they're getting through the clearinghouse as their own? Say that again, Neil. Do, do any of the lawyers of the insurance adjusters that pick up those doctors through the clearinghouse, do they ever actually use them as their own lawyer? I mean, as their own doctor? No. I mean, you, I, it would be it would be shocking to me. I mean, these these people go, there's a saying in the industry, and do, they've at, literally asked doctors, how many bad opinions for the insurance company can you give before you won't get hired again? In other words, how many be before they stop using you? And the answer is two. The general consensus is two bad opinions wow. and they they won't use them again. And so, so uh, when you're going you, we can use that to our advantage. Yeah, tell me that. So when when t tell me how it is that when you're because I've watched you cross examine one of these guys and he have you ever seen that skit, John? I thought of the skit from Saturday Night Live where um, Martin Short, I believe, was playing the executive and he started sweating and he was like smoking that cigarette that had the ash all the way out to here. And I, when I yeah. watched this guy, I thought you just dismantled this guy. The guy needed a topo when he was done. So tell me about how you actually prepare and how you take apart those guys using their bias and their, their history. Give me a word. Yeah. So the greed, remember a lot of it's motivated by greed, which means they get paid more, the more cases that they do the, um, and, and you know, look, there's some good doctors out there. So I'm not saying this blanket statement there. They, they, I have come across, but I've come across, across way more bad ones. And, you know, they're motivated by making a lot of money, by doing volume uh, insurance company exams in this particular case. And the more they do, the more money that they make. This guy had, hadn't even, didn't even have a practice anymore. So his only source of income was trying to get these insurance company uh, examinations, which made him even more invested in willing to say or do anything to try to keep this source of income since he had closed up his business. And so one of the things uh, that, they're vulnerable, I believe, most of them, is because they do so many uh, that they don't understand the facts as well as we do, as well as we should, at least. And so, you know, I'll never be able to argue neurosurgery with a neurosurgeon and best him on the medicine. But I can best him on the facts because I've been living and breathing with this case for two years, three years. I know my What's clients. The difference in your mind? I've been to their what house. About that? What's the difference in your mind? What's that? You, tell me the difference when you're saying that. You, you won't best him on the medicine, but you'll best him on the facts. What do you mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this guy's been practicing neurosurgery his entire life, his entire career. He's board certified. He's been to medical school. All he does is this every day. He knows the studies. He knows this. He knows that. When I find that generally, once you start trying to go down the road where you're arguing about the medicine, he's he has such a good grasp of that. Um, and he has 
a, an air of credibility too, just based on his pure experience, that it's very hard to go tit for tat and argue medicine. Uh, but it's not as hard to argue facts in a set parameters. So for example, in my case that I had um, that you're discussing, there was a, my guy was in a car crash. He had a serious brain bleed and he all, and it caused him, um, it caused him to uh, have brain damage. Okay. Mm. And my expert said that part of the brain damage was caused not by the brain bleed itself, but because so much blood actually flowed down into my client's lungs that it caked his esophagus and suffocated him. What happens when you don't breathe? Your brain dies, right? So this this doctor had not considered anything related to the lungs. All he said was, I looked at the brain. There was this small bleed on the brain. Mr. Marco, your client was not that brain damaged by this small bleed, right? So one approach would be to try to argue with him that, yes, this small bleed could cause that type of brain damage. And then you're going down rabbit holes that you know, are very difficult. Which part of the brain is it in? Things of that nature, you know, what type of bleed was it? There's, there's so much, there's so much. I'm probably not going to win that. Um, but what I could win is the facts by, and that's what I did. The, the guy didn't know the facts. The guy didn't know because he didn't review the records like I did. He didn't know that my guy actually had to have a tube stuck down his throat because there was so much blood caked in it that he could no longer breathe and was suffocating to death. And they saw that and they had to put uh, oxygen into his lungs. So it was easy to set him up with. Doctor, you, you certainly would agree that uh, that loss of oxygen to the brain can cause brain damage, correct? Yes. And that can cause the type of brain damage that my client had in this case, yes. And that uh, obviously if you, if you can't breathe because you have blood caked in your lungs and your esophagus, uh, that can cause lack of oxygen, which can cause brain damage, right? And so these, these are, you know, medical basic things that he, he has to agree with. Um, and then the fact that he didn't even consider that, we were able to then turn to, and you never even considered whether that, that was a contributing factor in this case. Oh, no, no. You, you know, I wasn't asked to look at the lungs. <laughs> and, and who, that, so the insurance company that hired you in this case told you don't look at the lungs, Right. They're paying you. They told you not to look at the lungs, even though lack of oxygen in the lungs can cause brain damage. And so, you know, it's a, it's a very complex area, but it's made pretty simple. You don't get oxygen, your brain dies. Mm -hmm. Brain yeah. dies, you have brain damage. Uh, and so th this is just a way that we can use the facts that the guy didn't know, didn't review the records that contained evidence of the... Um, suffocation to the, to the lungs. And so was not able to give an opinion. And so the jury clearly didn't believe this guy by the end of it, combined with the financial bias and motive, which you, which I always start off with first, right? Establish who the guy is biased, financially motivated, saw the guy one time, um, limited experience, didn't talk to any of the, uh, treating physicians, didn't talk to the family, you know, this guy's getting paid for a 45 minute consult and he's going to give opinions in this case. It sounds kind of crazy when you break it down, doesn't it? Especially compared to the treating physicians and things of that nature. Um, so, you know, and even you if you don't know that, anything, are you watching the jury as you're examining witnesses? Are you looking at them to kind of, do you have somebody that's sort of helping you with eyes and ears when you're in the courtroom? Or is it all John Marco? Yeah, no, I, I have people that I that are watching the jury. Sometimes I'll look at the jury. Um, you know, I find it's a balance, Neil. You don't want to be the guy pandering to the jury, looking at them after every question. Um, and it also depends on the on your relationship with the jury. Hopefully, you got you got a lot of voir dire, so you'll have a good relationship with the jury, a comfortable relationship where you can consider them as part of your group. Um, I always use words like us, like you're not, instead of saying, you know, doctor, you're telling me, you know, I will look at the jury and I might say, you know, you're telling us that you didn't even consider 
Now you, a whole you part do of something more than just speak there, though. You actually use the word "us" for those listening on the actual verbal podcast, the audio podcast. You did that, and then I could see a little bit. You were like, you came alive as you were talking about that. You took a step back, right? Created some distance, then created some proximity between you and the and the 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 presumed jury, and then you right. kind of opened your arms up to them to like. Like you would if you were talking about we, well, you're going to help us, right? I mean, you're making yourself part of the group, which is, and you're right. making them part of your group. So, are those things that you do consciously, or do you just because there are people that do it very consciously and very methodically, and there are other people that just have that natural, um, that sort of that natural feel for how to to include the the jury and to make this about us versus them? No, I, I do it unconsciously now. Um, it's part of my muscle memory, which is where I think everyone should try to get. Uh, I just, I attended a trial seminar by Mark Lanier who talked about these things. And it's, you know, you can start to try to make a habit of doing these certain things on a conscious level, but the goal is to get to a point where you're just doing it automatically, where it's a muscle memory, where you don't have to think about it. Because when we are thinking about it, we're not in the moment, right? I'm now having to like use my brain processing power to not be in the moment anymore, to now think, okay, I need to move my body. I need to look at the jury. I need to do this. While listening to the witness, while thinking of my next question, while reacting, it's too much. I mean, maybe some people can do it. Um, I find it, it's, it's hard to do. And so when I first started out, I would have to try to do conscious things that I learned, such as, you know, body language, things of that nature. But you want it, the more you do it, the better you get, and the more it just becomes a part of your practice. I'm certainly, I would hope, a much better lawyer than I, than I was 10 years ago when I was trying the case, um, where things are more deliberate, but when you have that deliberate, deliberateness, it's not as authentic, and you're having to, to have conscious thinking, which is slowing down your other things. You can get where it's automatic. Practice, practice, practice. The more cases you try, the easier it gets. Every single voir dire I do is a little bit easier for me than the last voir dire. It may not be better. You know, I just tried a case a couple of weeks ago. It wasn't my best voir dire, but it was easier. I'm... I'm it's, it's easier to do these things naturally because they become ingrained as part of your, your automatic response, your automatic muscle memory. You know, it's like blinking, right? Like we blink all the time. You know, you have to think about blinking when you're, when you're like right. a little baby or a little, you know, it's, it's, it it's makes things harder. Right. So John, tell yeah, me about instinct. your, I mean, tell, and, me, tell me about your, first of all, tell me about, just give me a sample if you would, or give me an example. I don't want to put you on the spot anymore than I have. Um, tell me about some of your like, about what you know? how, tell me about your voir dire a bit so we talked about voir dire a moment ago tell me about your voir dire tell me about like when you turn to the jury do you like what are some of the first things that you talk to them about how do you get them to open up to you what are some of the most important things for you to discuss with them yet yeah, in the ideal world where you have unlimited voir dire I spend a lot of time. Unfortunately, a lot of judges don't allow us that latitude. And so you have to style your voir dire to how much time you have. If I have a lot of time, you know, I always introduce um, myself to the jury. You, first, you want to introduce your client, thank the jury for being there, and then explain to them what voir dire is. Because remember, we like it's natural for us, but unless the judge has taken time, which some judges don't, they're just like, go ahead, Mr. Marco, it's your jury. They don't know what the hell's going on. And, and you're so, first up because you're the you plaintiff know, right? in these cases, right? So you're first up. So if the judge has to give first up is the plaintiff. Right, right. So you're getting them really like, you're getting them really raw. I don't try to argue my case in voir dire. I want to talk about the worst things about my case that I am scared of the most. And uh, get them right out there. So, you know, first explain the process to the jury. I say, you know, my name's John Marco. 
uh, introduce your clients. And this is Vaudier. And Vaudier is actually French, and it means to speak the truth. And I know this is a weird process, right? You, you get your jury summons in the mail. It says you must come down to the court under penalty of law. And they, I'm sure they shuffled you guys into a room this morning and made you watch a boring video. And you don't know what's going on. And then they file you into this room in front of a judge and me and my client and the defense attorneys over there. And then they call a number like you're playing bingo and then make, make it even more awkward because now you have to get up and walk into this box. And then you have me up here who you've never met before. And I'm asking you to tell me your, your deepest feelings and secrets that you wouldn't even feel comfortable talking uh, with people, friends and family about. And, you know, the, the, this process is not about if you're a fair person. I like to think that most people I know believe or try to be fair. This isn't about that. This isn't about if you're a good or bad juror. This process is about whether this is the right case for you. Because there's a it's bunch of cases really going on in this courtroom, in this courthouse. And if this isn't the right case for you, we'll find one that is. And, so smart. Uh, you, so smart because you're immediately giving them permission right you're giving them the opportunity to take a deep breath and to feel like they're they don't have to somehow thread a needle with an answer and you're saying it's okay like, you could say that yeah. this isn't the moment for you and move on to do something else great so go on that that's the most important thing is is to give them permission and to make it okay to talk about these things because it's hard to get people to talk about these things especially on some issues and i always share first so i'll say so i'll start you know i'm going to ask you to share so i'll start with myself i represent a lot of uh victims of sexual assault little boys and girls who've been molested and i can tell you that if i was ever called to have to sit in the box like you all and they told me that this case was about a little boy or girl being molested I'm a dad, but even beyond that, based on my experience representing those people, I can tell you before I heard any evidence in the case, before the first document was presented or the first piece of testimony, I'm already going to be leaning against the guy who's alleged did that stuff, the guy or girl who was alleged did that stuff. And that's not fair. And so if I was called in the box, I'd raise my hand and I'd say, you know, I've had these experiences I'm having, I think it's going to be tough for me from the get go because I'm already starting off a little bit over here. I'm already starting off with a little bias from my experiences that I wouldn't want myself on this jury if I was sitting there. And so that's a good thing, way to do it is ask yourself, would you want yourself on this jury if, if you were the plaintiff? Uh, another thing that, uh, I just saw Jeff just use this, which was, I thought, a great analogy in Michigan. And there's different variations on this. But, you know, you could say it's like, you know, my one of my good friends is a Michigan fan. And one of my other good friends is a Michigan State fan. And I don't care. We could be watching the same game. And they're both seeing the calls differently. And no matter what happens, no matter how bad or good, he's going to want Michigan to win. And my other friend, no matter what goes on in the game, no matter how well or how poorly they play, they're going to want Michigan State to win. And I could tell them, you know, this is the better team, that's the better team, but uh, they're, they're, they're so behind their team that it would be hard for them to say, I want the other team to win, or the other team really should win in the game. And so they're starting out with kind of that preference or that bias. And so that's what we're trying to find out. Um, and then... How did you can your issues. I, I don't. I, when Jeffrey did that, how did they started laughing? Reaction? Yeah, they laughed. They loved it because you could see people relating it to themselves, right? And that's the best thing is getting mm -hmm. them to relate it to themselves. Right. You know, you could see some people thinking, "Yeah, I'm a Michigan fan," or "I'm a Michigan State fan." Another great thing that um, I, I've seen a lot of lawyers do—I used it in my last trial—is you do you do the pie eating contest. And so, you know, my I, I always say my mom baked the best rhubarb pie, you know, Mr. Rockine, let, let's, let, let's say that you're the judge of the pie eating contest, like the judge of this case. And my mom always made the best 
rhubarb pie. I believe it's the best rhubarb pie in the world. And she gave me the recipe for it. And let's say I bake for the pie eating contest for, for your judging pleasure, the best rhubarb pie in the world. I'm talking like fresh out of the garden rhubarb. This thing is, is baked to a crisp perfectly. I bake the best rhubarb pie in the world. And let's say uh, the defense attorney over here bakes, uh, you know, a pretty decent uh, apple pie, let's say. Uh, and we submit these to you, but, you know, Mr. Rackon, you're allergic to rhubarb. Or, or maybe, you know, you've hated rhubarb since you were a little kid. Uh, maybe you couldn't stand it. You know, maybe, maybe you just had a bad experience with rhubarb pie. No matter how good of a rhubarb pie I make, no matter how good the ingredients are, no matter how perfect it is, no matter how righteous that rhubarb pie is, you hate rhubarb pie. And I'm probably not going to win the contest. I'm, and no. it's not because I didn't make a good pie. It's just because you really hate rhubarb pie. And that's okay because we don't all like the same things. But maybe you wouldn't be a good judge for a rhubarb pie contest. And um, that's another way to kind of get this across. There's different ways to do it. Um, and then I test the worst things. You know, I, I, I just had this case. I got, a, I got this lady off her cause. My client had an affair while the case was pending. Okay. And the defense found out about it because it was in his psychiatry records. I tried to keep it out. The judge said it's coming in and it goes to damages. So, you know, I, you just, I put this right out there. You know, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to hear in this case something that I'm, that I'm ashamed of that my client's ashamed of, it's pretty embarrassing, and that there's no excuse for it. But I need to ask you about it because I'm concerned about it in this case. My client had an affair on his wife while this case was pending. I know it's not a good thing, but, you know, what do you think about that? People, you know, are like, oh, that's horrible, but, you know, Mr. Marco, this case isn't about an affair, you know, da 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 But, you know, I people... If you set this up right so people feel comfortable, a lady said, I need to talk to you. And that's another thing I do. I, I, you know, I always say, listen, if there's a subject that you do not feel comfortable talking about in front of all of us, please let us know that you need to talk to me, Mr. Defense Attorney, and the judge. And we'll talk to you in private. And she raised her hand, said, I need to talk in private, and said... You know, I was with you guys until I heard about the affair, and I don't think I can be fair because somebody cheated on me, and she started crying, and she said, "I'm I'm still angry about it." And so, so that's yeah, that's those I, really, those are, I believe in. Those are very very effective ways to approach the jury and to begin the process of identifying fairness and bias and. I should say, even other than fairness, really latent inherent bias that some people have, and they may not even know that they have it. Right. Everybody thinks that they're fair. Nobody comes in and thinks that, oh, I'm going to be unfair in this case. Right. But by doing what you're doing, you're showing that you have the ability to attempt to draw out from people very effectively examples, analogies, and ways to show them that, you know what, it's okay if you're like me, John Marco, and you have some things that you um, that that may put the other side behind a bit, or put me behind a bit, and I want to know if I'm getting that. If I'm starting at the starting line, or am I starting behind? Um, so those are obviously very effective. Um, you've had some huge verdicts using in in, in trials. I mean, some of them are whoppers, and you've had some really monster verdicts, right? Yeah, I just found out today that a $12 million verdict was affirmed unanimously by the Court of Appeals that I was really had some sleepless nights over. I had a right, so, very conservative so listeners, panel. That means that, means that, that drinks are on John Marco. <laughs> drinks are on me. Drinks no, are so on tell me. me more. Tell me more. Uh, it was a big employment case. It's the largest intact state discrimination case in the history of Michigan. Mm. Figer had one bigger 
called Gilbert versus Chrysler for like 19 million, but it got overturned on appeal. And I was worried the same thing was going to happen to me. Uh, but uh, it was affirmed unanimously today. This was a case I had worked on since 2017, Neil. So five years. Um, I had I went up to Flint and stayed in a hotel room for five weeks by myself with an assistant who helped me. Um, and it was a tremendously difficult time because I was just starting out with my new law firm. And this was kind of like the make it or break it. Uh, but today we found out, thank God, it was affirmed. Uh, and it's, it was, it's been a great day because it's like the greatest news to deliver to my client who's Fantastic. been waiting for so long. So tell me, I know you've had some other significant verdicts. And I will tell you one of the things that I've most admired about you, John, you're, you're a young guy. And I see you out there in social media where you are, are talking about your firm, talking about your office, talking about your practice, sharing a lot. Um, you know, so I, I have a lot of respect for that. And I, I, it has to, do your clients mention it to you when they come to want to hire you and talk to you about it? Do they bring up that they saw you on social media? Do they tell you that they've seen you here or there? I mean, how's that impacted your relationship with your clients? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I get a lot of cases, you know, I, I, I am lucky in the sense that a lot of the case, the case, the subject and practice areas that I do are newsworthy, right? It's not just car crashes, although we do that too, but it's civil rights cases, discrimination at the state level or at the governmental level, um, heinous abuse of governmental power, or police brutality cases. These are generally more newsworthy type cases. And so because of that, there has been a lot of coverage on some of the cases. So yeah, people will say they saw me on the news, or they saw a news article about a verdict, or they saw social media. Um, so I, I do believe you know that's made things uh, easier in terms of you know being able to reach more people and help people. Um, so you know I, I always believe. Yeah, tell me because I because I know you you touched on something that I think people maybe not realize: civil rights cases. They are rewarding cases i'm sure for you but they're probably also frustrating because they are tough oh right? my god they're, they're tough cases they're so tough i don't know if you saw ben crump's uh thing on netflix his his latest um it's called civil but ben crump who's probably the most well-known civil rights lawyer in the country right now was talking about how his civil rights department which is what he's known for is his least profitable department. Mm. And that may sound crazy, but these cases are so hard, Neil. They take so long. I mean, look at this case today, five years in, um, I have over $200,000 in costs on the case and that I haven't seen. That's just been floating there for five years, not, not even taking into account my time. The defendants get appeals sometimes even before you get to court. So imagine your, your case, you don't even get to trial and they get an appeal before the trial, then they get another appeal after the trial. Civil rights is really tough. That's why a lot of people don't do it. And even when you get to the courtroom, uh, a lot of people are biased against uh, the plaintiffs and the types of cases because, you know, you have a, a, maybe a police officer defendant who, you know, we all want to love and trust the police. We all depend on the police for our families. Um, and so they're tough, tough cases but they can make a difference. Uh, and that's one thing that it's I'm passionate about. So we've been able to, to do that. And I believe in helping out other lawyers, you know, lawyers will contact me all the time. Hey, Marco, I saw you had this case. Can you send me your brief? Or I, I you know, can, can you tell me what you did in this case or send me your transcripts? I always do that because people have always helped me and I'll never forget it. And, and, it makes us better, I think, when we help each other out as a community, a lawyer community like that. So I've been Something a big believer in that. You, John, you kind of paying it back. I think that, that it's worth noting that you're not just another young guy. You're not just a, a, a guy with long hair and a pretty face and $12 million verdict that you just got affirmed on appeal. Um, but you're out there and have been selected 
and have accepted the role of teaching other lawyers and some of the top, I'll say, presentation groups, lawyer advocacy groups, trial groups around the country. I know that you took part and had a presentation at Trial Lawyers University out in Las Vegas. Las Vegas, right? It was TLU live in Las yeah. Vegas. And that was like, that was the consortium of, that was the com high commission of lawyers. I mean, like, if yeah, the defense awesome. bar wanted to eliminate great trial lawyers, you were all in one spot. <laughs> You had All like a, in one spot. At one you may time. have had one person who held back somewhere, like a designated survivor, so a designated survivor somewhere. But you guys were all together, Panish and you, and I, I could list them on and on. But you guys were all in one spot, um, uh, Rex. Right? I mean, and you, our lawyer from Michigan, man, you were you you took part in in a presentation. That is amazing. What high praise. It was awesome. You know, it was an honor to be able to take part in that. And um, I was, I felt just among greats to be out there and presenting alongside some of the greatest names in the country for this. And, and, you know, my, look, my dad was a teacher, so I think it's always been in my blood. I've always loved to teach and love to help, help others with that. And, you know, I started doing like little groups in Michigan then I started kind of doing some things for Michigan Association of Justice locally. And then it just kind of grew from there. And, you know, even just helping people at the courthouse who say, I got, you know, I, I had a guy, I got Marco, I got an employment case. I don't, I think I'm in over my head. What should I do? And we end up, you know, co-counseling and helping each other out. That collaboration is what this is all about because what makes you better makes me better. And hopefully what makes me better makes you better. You know, I had people call me this morning about the opinion that came down from the Court of Appeals that we were just talking about, because that's going to help all the employment practitioners on the plaintiff side. It's going to help bring values up. It's going to help build case law. And so we're all stronger together, I believe. Uh, now, certainly, you know, we're fighting for some of the same clients and, you know, we got to run a business and whatnot, but. Uh, we we, we got to remember we're stronger together. All right. I got a speed round of questions, John. And then I'm, so you ready? Here we go. So first one is cross-examination and trial work. If you had to pick one, art or science? And you can only pick one side. Art or science? Cross-exam? Mm -hmm. Is it an art? I got to go with art, man. Art. I got to go with art. I got to go with art. <laughs> All right. Next one, if there was one person that you could have represent you in history, like if you had to go to court and have someone represent you and you can't say Jeffrey, who would it be? Okay. I'm giving, uh, I'm giving probably, you an out because I, 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 I know you've got a relationship with Jeff, but I, I'm going to, because I know Jeffrey's awesome, but I, I got I to gotta ask you to go like deeper in the bench. Who would it be? All right, what, what, what is it for? What type of case? We'll, we'll say a civil rights case. We'll say civil a rights case? civil rights case, a medical malpractice right, then, case. I got to go Vince Colella, man. My Vince. <laughs> All right. Vince is So if Vince you could take a, if you could second chair other than Jeffrey or Vince, any lawyer anywhere in the country in any case, like just a second chair and take part and just say, I'm going to help out. Who would it be? Probably Jerry Spence. Tell me but why. But Jerry Spence like 20 years ago, you know, because he hasn't been in the courtroom in a while. Tell me why. Tell me why Jerry Spence. Uh, Jerry helped me kind of discover myself. Like I had lost three cases in a row when I went out to the ranch. And that's a hard beat, especially for a plaintiff's lawyer. You know, this isn't this isn't a quick case. These are three, three uh, cases. I mean, that took a long time. And uh, Jerry is just kind of a one of a kind lawyer, kind of like a legend. And he almost has a type of magic about him. Spell, but you know, he has and, a spell binding uh, way about it. Right. So, yeah, I would have loved to try a case with Spence. All right. Last couple of questions in my speed round. These are important. Okay. Is there anything anybody could ever do to get you to cut your hair? 
<laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> but I have been putting it into a, like a man bun. Yeah. I've been experimenting with for some of the most recent trials that involved a little more conservative areas. Okay. If there's one person anywhere in history that you could cross-examine, like, and who would it be? Anybody in history, who would it be? Oh, my God. I'll give you an example. It would let be me, so Let me give you just a, a little bit of background. People have said OJ. Some have said World War II figures. Some have said people from, you know, some have said political figures. So I don't want you to feel like you're, this is just a, a yeah. good answer. Who would you want to go after on the stand if you could? I would probably want to go at like Hitler. I think like one of the most evil people ever I, I, I could just unleash and have no uh, sense of holding back. Because we enough. always have to have a little sense of holding back. Yeah, not, right? not with him. I think you'd be able to... <laughs> Not with him. You could do whatever you want to him, man. Yeah. Okay. Or Jack Nicholson from A Few Good Men. That would be fun. Okay. That would. I, I can see you doing a good. I can see you. I can see you doing a, a a good. As he starts walking off, I didn't excuse you yet. And the guy's like, "Excuse me." Yeah. Yeah. You're not. I'm not through with my examination. <laughs> so, all right. If you could have one do-over in the practice law, I'm not talking about a particular case or result. Right, you do best you can with the results. Maybe with a witness, maybe with a juror, maybe with an objection. I had one lawyer told me that he actually did. He he shat himself during um, a cross examination. Uh, he would have liked to have that moment back. Um, I, he had another where he misunderstood the witness and he went after him, and the witness was like, "Hey, I, I was with you up until the moment you started haranguing me." So one one moment that you could take that or do over. Like one trial moment? Like one, one trial moment. Yeah. Um I had this case where my client I was young and I was so focused, I was not paying attention to what was going on around me, and my client had a shirt on that said, I love P U S S Y. And I didn't notice it until halfway through the examination when I had to call a break, had him turn it inside out. Uh, and, but it, it was too late. Everybody, that everybody is sorry. That's a great word. But that's just tunnel vision. Yeah, man. right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. So, all right, last, John, you're one of, you're one of the most, uh, I think, accessible, visible lawyers in Michigan. Um, and in the country, but just so, and, and I want people to know that um, this was not like a canned interview. So I don't have a script that I'm working off of. John doesn't have a script he's working off of. He doesn't even have a set of headphones in, which is why he's got to pause every couple of times if I talk over him. Um, but he's a great, engaging guest, and that should just give you a little bit of a clue how good of a trial lawyer he actually is if you have a case and you want to talk to him about it. You can find work that he's done, videos, um, talks, his name, but if somehow you just can't let your fingers do the walking on the Internet, I want John to tell, tell you, tell us where can people find you, where can they see you, how can they reach you to get a more of John Martin. Yeah, thanks, Neil. It's easy. All you have to do is go to marcolaw.com, M-A-R-K-O law.com, or just type in John Marco into Google, J-O-N-M-A-R-K-O. People misspell it all the time, J-O-H-N, M-A-R-C-O, but it's K-O, so M-A-R-K-O. And our, our phone number here is 313-777. 7 law. So 313-777-7 law. Our website's great because you can submit a case review. And if you're a referring attorney, there's a referral tab and you can submit it because we always pay our referral fees to my fellow attorneys, criminal. I got a lot of criminal defense attorneys that send, send us a lot of stuff because you guys see stuff first before anyone else. Uh, or you can email me my email is john, J-O-N, 
at marcolaw.com, M-A-R-K-O law.com. All right. So, John, it's been a long time coming uh, to have you on the podcast. Um, it's been fantastic. You know, the podcast has really been growing and growing and growing. And I'm so glad that, um, look, you're a giant. You're a nationally known lawyer and you're a giant in the, in the, in the field. And you're, you know, right in the, in our backyard here in Michigan. And why shouldn't you be on this podcast talking? Just so you know, we've interviewed, I've interviewed Tom Mesereau and Mark Yaragos and Alan Dershowitz and F. Lee Bailey made me rest in peace. And, um, yeah. Lisa Bloom and, and you absolutely belong um, among those lawyer greats. So, Guys, this is John Mar. This is Neil Rockine. I'm not John Marco. I'm Neil Rockine. That's John Marco. John absolutely does killer cross examination, and I'm proud to, to have had him on the podcast. John, I so appreciate it. Thank you, Neil, and you're you're awesome, man. It was an honor to be here and hang out with you for a little bit this afternoon. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Give me one second to shut it down here. second just to shut it off this part won't be on there because i'm using like a new platform no worries buddy